Thank you all for coming. I hope that um, you're all enjoying reading the first, actually I gave you much more than half of um, News From Nowhere for the simple reason that for next, uh, our next and last session, I'm adding another reading, uh, which is that um, excerpt from the book Half Earth Socialism by uh, Troy Vitesse and Drew Pendergrass. And it's a book that speculates about a possible socialist future a la Morris and actually leans quite heavily on news from nowhere to think through possible new ways of social organization. So we're going to read an excerpt from that. And I don't want to get anybody's hopes up, but it's possible that Drew Pendergrass might join us for a little bit of that. I've, I've extended an invitation to him and I've been talking to him. So we'll see if he can make it. Uh, but that would be really fun if he can come and talk about that um, his book a little bit as well. But either way, we'll read an excerpt from that. So you'll have, you know, only like a a third to a quarter of the Morris left to read. So, and I, I do want to try to stick to that um, through chapter 20 business, just in case there is anybody who hasn't finished it yet. Uh, one thing I do want to say about the way the book is set up is um, I hope that people didn't start reading and are just like, oh my God, this is so boring because all the narrative part, all the, the plot and kind of interesting fun stuff between characters all happens in the section that you haven't read yet. <laughs> So stuff does start happening. I realize there's a lot of description. And that's, of course, one of the things about utopia, right, is that it's the complaint about utopian fiction in general is that it's not narratable, right? That utopia is a, when everything's perfect, what is there to say uh, about, you can describe things and you can talk about how you got there, but there isn't really any plot. And of course, is that one like lovely little moment where Clara, uh, Dick Hammond's, uh, wife and lover uh, says, I wish that some, you know, I wish that things happened to us that people would want to write about, right? So, and there's actually quite a lot in the part of the novel that you're going to read for next time about this very question of, of do you need a liter literature in a utopia? Do you need history in utopia? So we'll dive a lot more into those kind of aesthetic, artistic questions, literary questions for next time. Um, so for today, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about contextualizing this novel in terms of some of the things that I was discussing on the, in the first session, um, the, the, my work on utopia and thinking about the 19th century utopia as a kind of imaginative resource, right? So I'm gonna share my screen here because I've got a few quotations that'll be easier to process if you can see them. So, um, okay, is that showing up? Okay, great. Um, okay, so I want to start with two quotations, and they're they're kind of they're they're dense, right? It's not like they're you know they're 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 theoretically dense. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time in each one, and that's another reason why I wanted to put them up on the screen um, so that you can actually kind of uh, see them and 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 read along as I'm reading them to you. So the first quotation is from a theorist who's writing about Ernst Bloch. So. You may or may not remember, but last time um, in the introductory section, I talked about Ernst Bloch as one of the central theorists of utopia in the 20th century. So he's a Marxist historian, philosopher, psychoanalyst, um, affiliated more or less with the Frankfurt School. Uh, and he is basically one of his, his magnum opus, The Principle of Hope, is a kind of huge work on utopia. And I talked, uh, just to refresh memories, I talked a little bit about how he made the distinction between uh, utopian program and utopian impulse, right? So that the utopian program is like a blueprint for the future. It's actually kind of like, here's how we're going to achieve this new society, whereas utopian impulse is any kind of Psych psychic or emotional or psychological yearning toward a better life in any way, right? Um, and then there's a difference between concrete and abstract utopia as well, which we don't necessarily need to go into for, for the purposes of this quotation. Um, but I just wanted you to remember that's who Ernst Bloch is. So this is a theorist writing about Ernst Bloch's discussion of utopia. Literature as utopia is generally encroachment of the power of imagination on new realities of experience. Its temporal point of reference is the future. However, it does not withdraw from the reality principle. Oops, sorry, that's a typo there. Reality principle should be PLE. I think that was an autocorrect. Um, merely to place an ethereal and empty realm of freedom in place of the oppressive realm of necessity. Rather, it does this intentionally to test human possibilities, 
to conserve human demands for happiness and playfully to anticipate what in reality has not been at all produced, but what dreams and religious or profane wish images of humans are full of. Literary activity becomes a special form of dream work. So this is Yuding's um, summary in a sense of, of an important aspect of Ernst Bloch's writing, which is like I said, it's about that utopian impulse, right? That idea that even uh, outside of really concrete laid out programs for achieving particular social organizations in the future, there's also a kind of universal, and Bloch really did think it was more or less universal, desire for a better life, desire for, for imagining the future and hope. Uh, the book is called The Principle of Hope, right? So that's very much what he's focused on. And so this idea that literary utopia is a place for the exercise of that Im imagination. I mean, obviously literature is imaginative in general, but in this case, there's a kind of a special relationship between imagination and reality, right? That there is, um, and as you'll see at the end of News From Nowhere, there's a kind of a wonderful line, I don't want to give you spoilers here, but there's a kind of a wonderful line that sums up this idea of, you know, is it, is this actually a blueprint? Is this something that could happen in the future? It's almost kind of like, um, you know, Christmas Carol, like, is this the necessary future? Or is this just one possible future? Is it still, can it still be changed or whatever? Um, it's almost kind of the flip side of that, right? Where it's like, is this something that's just a fantasy um, or is it actually, is it a dream or is it something that could be put into place in reality? And so literature is um, a dream work in that sense, right? Because it's kind of in, um, straddling the fence between those two possibilities. The other quotation I wanna look at is, is about, um, oops, sorry, advancing here, there we go. Um, it, it's, this is a book by uh, a theorist, Paul Meyer as a French Marxist theorist uh, about William Morris in particular. And, uh, well, I'll just read it here for you. All his, Morris's, writings show that he is dealing with a hypothesis, one that seems most logical and pleasing to him, but more than once he stops himself making a doctrine out of it. He deliberately leaves obscure the answers to various problems and is not afraid of allowing imprecision, even in consequence, to creep in now and then. He is careful not to draw up a detailed plan of future society and aims above all to suggest a utopian scale of values. So this again goes to that question of, you know, what is literature, literary utopia doing, particularly what is Morris doing? Um, that difference again between blueprint and impulse, right? Between blueprint, I'll call it a difference between blueprint and dream work, right? A blueprint, this is what the Marxist, and again, I talked about this last time, this is what the what Marx himself and other Marxist theorists critiqued about British uh, utopian socialism and French utopian socialism was that uh, by imagining future societies, they were sort of detracting energy from the revolution, right? That like we weren't going to actually bring about any kind of change in society as long as we were distracted with kind of fantasizing about these beautiful, perfect social uh, societies in the future. Um, and this again is a response to that to say, you know, he's not actually, he doesn't actually give us a blueprint in a sense. I mean, yes, we see the way that nowhere works. We see the way that the people have organized themselves, et cetera, but it's not, um, it's not presented as, you know, here's a very schematic or programmatic way of going about setting up a society like this. It's much more about affect, right? And about values. And that values thing, I think the utopian scale of values is really important. Um, this is one of the things uh, I'm going to use this word defamiliarization, which is often used in, um, you know, uh, literary theory and especially Marxist and political theory. Um, but this is what I think Morris is doing in this novel, and not just me, but a lot of people think Morris is doing in this novel, is that he's really trying to prod his readers, us, to think more deeply about underlying assumptions, right? So it's not even so much about, and this goes right straight back to, uh, to Moore's utopia, right? That it's uh, utopia traditionally been read as a critique of the society of the writer, right? Um, not necessarily thinking about actual possible um, societies, but more uh, satire, right? Satire or commentary on the the social organization of the of the person writing at the time. And I think uh, it's not quite the same here because it is a little bit more in that direction of dream work, right? Where Morris really is thinking about possibilities, but he's doing that by asking us to think about what we assume. What do we assume is necessary? What do we think is possible 
in terms of the way people can relate to each other, the way that resources can be allocated and distributed, the way that we can uh, deal with nature, right? Um, what do we think is impossible? In other words, what do we think? When we read a novel like News From Nowhere, what do we immediately say to ourselves? Ugh, that's unrealistic. Or, oh, that, that couldn't happen. Or people could never do, be that way. Or we could never do that, never achieve that, right? Those are the kind of touch points at which I think Morris is trying to get us to think about what, you know, where do we have those reactions? Um, and I think the way he gets at that is through the figure of Guest, of course. William Guest, the traveler, the traditional figure in a utopian novel who is introduced to the utopia and gets a guide, in this case, Old Hammond, the historian, who turns out to be his, maybe his grandson, right? Um, and the, the guide explains the society, right? But the fact that Guest is having this conversation as again, traditional in utopia, um, that confusion and the shape of that confusion is the occasion for the probing of those questions, right? It's, there's a twist on it because Guest in this case is very sympathetic, right? We know that William Guest is a socialist. He's one of the people at that meeting at the beginning of the novel. We know that he is William Morris in a sense, right? That's he's, he's the standard for Morris himself. And so his confusion and questions are not coming from a place of radical skepticism. He's not like, this is outrageous, communal property, you know, no money. That's just, that's terrible. It's a horrible idea. He's ex extremely attracted to the idea. That's the whole point is that he's longing for this. And that's almost kind of why he brings it into existence through this dream or vision or whatever it is. Um, but he's still you know, he still has that kind of position of confusion or that position of, of questioning that gives the reader that entree into uh, the probing of these fundamental questions. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today um, uh, is, um, I'll hold it for a second. The plan for today is I'm going to just talk for just a couple more minutes here. And then I have a few uh, discussion topics that I would like us to delve into together about the novel and get into some nitty gritty, but I thought I'd start by having us do some breakout rooms and give you a topic for each room uh, and spend a few minutes talking about that topic and then come back together to discuss it. Um, and, and what I want us to focus on in particular is exactly this question of defamiliarization, right? Where in the way that old Hammond and the other denizens of News From Nowhere, the way that they're presenting uh, their society and the way it operates and the way it works, where do we sense that feeling of, um, of defamiliarization? Where do we sense that resistance or that kind of presentation of uh, an outer limit of what is possible? So to that end, um, I know last time we talked about human nature, I always end up talking about human nature whenever I teach or talk about utopia, because it's kind of one of the first things that people say is like, oh, that, you know, human beings can't do that, etc. Um, so I thought it was this wonderful little moment where the exact phrase human nature is brought up in the novel. So I'll just read you this little exchange between Guest and Old Hammond. So the I is William Guest, of course. Said I, I have been told that political strife was a necessary result of human nature. Human nature, cried the old boy impetuously. What human nature? The human nature of paupers, of slaves, of slaveholders, or the human nature of wealthy freemen? Which? Come, tell me that. Well, said I, I suppose there would be a difference according to circumstances in people's action about these matters. I should think so indeed, said he. <laughs> One of the things I love about this novel is how old Hammond is just always pissed off, right? <laughs> it's like constantly being cranky, even though, you know, it's like, uh, you think everyone's supposed to be really happy and everybody in this future society is depicted as being, and there's a lot made of the fact that everyone's happy and that everyone's also very irritated a lot of the time, which I think is fascinating. Um, later, when you get into the latter sections of the novel, we actually come across um, two different sets of character, one, one character and then another group of characters who are not really on board with this whole new utopian society. So you actually get some kind of resistance there. Um, but old Hammond's uh, reaction, right? He's just kind of annoyed and irritated, whatever. I think it's a really, this is really the heart of it. Like this is the absolute heart of what, of what Morris is pushing his readers to do, right? Is to think about when we say a phrase like human nature, or we think that's impossible, that's not something human beings could ever do. That's just not the way, you know, we work. Um, he wants us to think, first of all, about the economic position of the person you're talking about, because of course he's first and foremost a socialist, right? 
But that question of economic position could be extended to any number of questions. It could be the human nature of, um, you know, of, of which or what genders, what the human nature of which or what races, the human nature of which or what, um, you know, nationalities. So, or any number of categories, right? Um, so it's just thinking about that or defamiliarizing that, that, that knee jerk kind of reaction that we have of like, this is something that, that people can never do, whatever. Uh, I think it, right, uh, really this little exchange really gets to the heart of what Morris is trying to get us to do in, in the context of this concept of defamiliarization. So I'm just gonna stop there. Um, like I said, I've picked out some discussion topics here. I'm not really sure, um, let me stop sharing here. Um, Okay, I'm not sure. Maybe we'll do, we should we could do three. We've got one, two, three topics. Okay, so let me go back. Um, all right, so let me just pick the three. I definitely want us to talk about, um, and we'll talk about more stuff too. We don't we we can move beyond the discussion topics, but I just thought as a way of breaking the ice and getting us to have some kind of smaller group conversations, um, economics and work. Right, so. And I'll just say a little bit about each topic and kind of what I'm thinking of, and but I'll leave it pretty open to y'all to, to talk about. Um, so the economics question, I was thinking I'd like us to delve into the question of value, right? What is what is value in this new society? What is considered valuable? How is value determined? Uh, how does the economic organization work? Um, where do we see scarcity and abundance, waste, like these kind of terms that come up even in uh, an economic organization that's radically different, right, from the one that that we have now, or that Morris had at the time that he was writing. Um, and I think I, we could combine that with the work question too, because obviously work is really important. The fact that you know how does work organized, or who does the work, or how do they get people to want to do work, etc. So we'll call that group, let's say, like economics and work. Um, and then I'm just writing this down for myself because I changed things. I'm changing things around a bit. Economics and work, and then the second one. Um, gender, I'd like to talk about gender and sexuality and love, right? And there's, there's actually gonna be a lot more to say about that after you finish the novel. Um, there's, like I said, there's actually exciting incidents that, <laughs> that happen in the second chunk of this book, um, but where there's plenty to talk about for now too. So um, gender, sexuality, and love. We have a little bit of an example of a love relationship in Dick and Clara. And then of course, we've got lots of discussion of the place of women and gender roles, et cetera. And then the third one, I would like to talk about art. I was gonna do nature and environment, but that's probably a topic that's better for after you finish the book, because there's gonna be a lot more stuff about the second half. Like I had you read up to the part where they start going up river and that's where you get a lot more description of the way of, of the natural world and the way, um, the way that the, the people of nowhere are interacting with the environment and labor, uh, agricultural labor, et cetera. So there'll be more to talk about uh, from nature and environment next time. So for the third topic, let's do art. And that would include literature, right? Uh, depictions of you know how, how literature works in this society, um, architecture. There's a lot of stuff about architecture, um, a lot of stuff about building um, and also history. I wanna throw history in there too, because you know, Old Hammond is an historian and there's a kind of interesting status of history in this in this book. So um, those are the three, three topics again, economics and work, gender, sexuality, and love, and then art, including literature, excuse me, architecture and history. Um, so I guess we're gonna do uh, random breakout groups at random. Is that, let's do it that way. So let's say, I think the groups end up being numbered, right? So well, just remember the numbers. One is economics, two is gender, and three is art. And okay. How long should we be in the, the breakout oh, groups? Oh, uh, let's say let's say fifteen minutes. Let's 15? say we'll check it in fifteen, and then um, so yeah. Actually, maybe thank you. Let me just say a little bit more about what what um suggest you all do in your breakout groups before we actually separate. And I'm going to be in one of them, right? I'll be assigned to one of them at random. I don't know which one. Um, general discussion of the topic, right? And then uh, it would be helpful if to come up with a passage or two so that we, when we come back together again as a group, we, you know, we'll have each group that did that particular topic kind of lead the conversation a little bit. I mean, I've got lots of passages and ideas too to, to, help, to help out, um, but it'll be helpful to have like a passage or two in mind or just kind of general ideas 
um, just have fun, free, freewheeling conversation on that topic. I think there's probably plenty to say about all three of those ideas. So um, yeah, so let's uh, let's split up and I'll let's come back together again in yeah, let's say 15 minutes and see how we go. Welcome back everybody. Sorry, mm -hmm. Renee, we were right in the middle of like an impassioned point and then <laughs> got <laughs> cut off and probably many of you have the same experience so we can continue um, continue our conversations now. So um, so let's, um, yeah, let's let's start by talking about these topics. Um, maybe we'll do the gender and sexuality and love one last because that was the group that I was in and start with the econ and the economics and work one and then move on to art and then talk about gender and sexuality third. Um, so let's just I'll just like turn it over to the people who are in that group who were talking about uh, the economic organization and, and labor. Um, what all did you discuss? And um, and we'll just kind of open it up for obviously everybody to join in and talk about. It. And if you found particular passages that well as well that you wanted to share that you thought were particularly um, illuminating for this question. Who first of all, who was in that group? Just out of the econ. Okay, great. Yeah, Dan and Ernie and I were were in that group. We're all unmuted, aren't we? Yes. Um, so I, I, I don't know that we got very terribly far with yeah. talking about the economic system, but uh, I, I guess two things that came up for me that we talked about were the idea of idleness as a disease, um, that uh, uh, there, there seems to be a redefinition of the nature of work that uh, uh, blurs the distinction between idleness and and work or at least calls into question traditional views about uh, work as a as a curse that is the idea that uh, in the fall of humankind uh, from Eden that we uh, humans were condemned to labor uh, so the ideal world would be one prior to labor but no in in nowhere uh, work seems to be the ideal. And mm -hmm. so we, we talked a little bit about how that fits or does not fit with Victorian notions or Dickensian notions of, uh, mm -hmm. of work. And that led us a little bit into uh, the division of labor uh, according to, to class, that uh, who, who works and who's idle in the 19th century is very different from who works and who's idle in, no one is idle in nowhere. Um, um, and then we started to talk a little bit about money. How, how do you, how, what, is this a barter economy? Uh, how, can, how can you, you know, go to a market and, and not have any money and, and still participate in the economy? So, um, but Dan and, and Ernie, uh, chip in and say what, what your questions were, your uh, view about things, economics. Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much just to echo what Dr. Jordan said. Um, really, you know, we were kind of wondering about the concept of, of idleness, how it had been reconfigured in this new society, how it applied, you know, across, um, you know, various, job or work or task related things. I mean, what what really did that imply, you know, for the kind of the day to day process of things? And also the exchange value currency. I mean, is there is there a currency in here or is it just a barter system? Uh, there seemed to be, you know, kind of some questions there that were, you know, um, we had input on. But we really I don't know if we really came to a, a final conclusion about. And Ernie, you had a had a question about the cheapening of labor. Is that it, right? Well, yeah, I had a question. Uh, it was just about what he's written there, but the the cheapening of production and the production. and the idea of um, oh, I don't know. I was trying to f kind of figure out what he was talking about because within that same section, it seemed like he was talking about. The, con the concept of separating work from what it gets you, what money, um, that it, there's not a direct link uh, between exactly what you're doing, what you're producing for the group or society, that you're creating this excess of uh, something, and then 
there would be then if that was the case well what's done with that i guess so who who takes care of that something who gets more of it who doesn't get more of it? or where's that used or whatever i don't know if there's so many questions than any kind of conclusions i even have questions of what he's talking about really for sure with there but mm. I think that goes right back to the quotation I started with. It's like, you know, he's in a lot of ways, he doesn't, he's not going into nitty gritty details, right? It's more about imagining um, a kind of, you know, set of social relations rather than like how, you know, some kind of blueprint for actual like central planning or, <laughs> or whatever. In fact, it's very decentralized. It's, it's much more like an anarchist, um, uh, anarchist socialist, right? Vision than it is like what we think of as a state socialist vision. So he even talks about that in the chapter, how the change came. There was an intermediary period of state socialism that, you know, didn't last because, and he talks about all the reasons it didn't last. And so that kind of central planning thing. So this is much more like I would, what I would call anarchism um, or, you know, economic anarchism, but yeah. So, what, okay. So let's, th those are all great. Um, and I think they're all su super important. The idea of idleness, um, money, and then basically, you know, labor, what is the, how do you get people to work? There's a whole chapter about it, right? Like how, on the incentive to work in a communist society. Um, let's start with the idleness thing. I think that's a really interesting question. Like what, what, all, what did everybody else make of this question of, let's take a look at the passage actually, and then maybe talk about it. It's, um, it's toward the end of chapter six, which is the chapter called A Little Shopping. And it's kind of the, the very, for those of you who have the Oxford version, it's on page 34. Um, and for those of you who don't, if you can find the paragraph that begins, so we got underway again, it's about a page from the end of chapter six. Um, and then about halfway through that paragraph, uh, besides it is, oh, the children like to amuse themselves. He's talking about like why there's so many children who are running the shops, right? Besides it is such very easy work that anybody can do it. It is said that in the early days of our epoch, there, was a, there were a good many people who were hereditarily afflicted with the disease called idleness <laughs> because they were the direct descendants of those who had in the bad times used to force other people to work for them. The people you know who are called slaveholders or employers of labor in the history books. Well, these idleness stricken people used to serve booths all their time because they were fit for so little. Indeed, I believe that at one time they were actually compelled to do some such work because they, especially the women, got so ugly and produced such ugly children if their disease was not treated sharply that all the, that the neighbors couldn't stand it. However, I'm happy to say that all that has gone by now. The disease is either extinct or exists in such a mild form that a short course of apparent medicine carries it off. It is sometimes called the blue devils now um, or the mully grubs. So <laughs> there's a lot going on there, right? But obviously, the idea that somehow idleness is hereditary, right? But but that it's it's not hereditary in the way that we think of her, like it's not genetic. Obviously, Morris didn't have the concept of genetics, but um, per se, he certainly Don't has you a think he's just of, poking fun at those lazy aristocrats. Yes, absolutely. Who yeah, become degenerative exactly. through intermarriage. Yes, absolutely. So right, it's hereditary in the sense of like. Um, we don't think of this normally as a hereditary class, right? Or we don't think of it as like a, a you know, being a, as being a slave holder or being a landowner, but that through perhaps intermarriage or whatever, you know, um, degeneration. And absolutely, degeneration discourse is like completely, it's all over this novel. It's just not being necessarily labeled directly as degeneration discourse. Um, so yeah, but then th then through like vigorous, you know, inbreeding or whatever, <laughs> eventually this disease of idleness will fall away. But but even so, right? That's the that's the point. Yes, it's a, it's satirical. He's making fun of the the landowning classes. Um, he's invoking the idea of heredity, heredity to do so. But even so, it's like it's still a strange notion to think that like. Um, that there's some kind of hereditary component to uh, not wanting to work, right? You could see how it would be something like a social or cultural formation that like you grow up as a rich kid who doesn't have to do anything because your father owns, you know, factories or slaves or whatever. Um, but that it's hereditary is an interesting kind of way of putting it. And I think that hereditary heredity becomes a kind of a shorthand for 
reproduction of social ills through which we have no other mechanism of explanation, right, in a way. Um, yeah, are there thoughts about that passage? I find myself like really interested in the ugliness, mm -hmm. um, especially because it makes me think back to the to the very beginning when like guest tries to give Dick money and he's like, Percy, you know, says maybe you should like give this to museum because like we've got plenty of money here. But then he's like, also like, look how ugly this 19th century money is. Like there's something like particularly worse about like worse about that money because it's ugly. And the idea here that, um, you know, because they, especially the women got so ugly and produced such ugly children that the neighbors couldn't stand it. That, that like, it's, you know, it's partly like, there's partly a kind of like her, her, hereditary, non, non-hereditary idleness, but that it's, it's like manifesting itself in these very um, aesthetic or aesthetically displeasing ways. And like that, you know, that's the sort of like identifying marker, but also that like all of these things are somehow connected, a kind of like, problematic, you know, a problematic, you know, way of relating to economics, a problematic way of working, of relating to the idea of work, and also a problematic way of relating to a certain kind of aesthetic standard, like that these are mm -hmm. all entwined with each other. And they're somehow, you know, they're all, they're all going to be like markers of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what does, exactly, like, what does ugliness have to do with idleness? Exactly, right? It's just that, it's, is it a shorthand? Is it just like Morris can't think of any any worse thing to say about something than that it's ugly? <laughs> it's just like the prime insult for him. And so therefore anything bad in any way is gonna like naturally turn into ugliness or be marked by ugliness. It becomes a kind of a shorthand. Um, yeah, but I I don't know. I think maybe there, there is a kind of a hint of, de of actual de ah, degeneration discourse in there too, right? It's like, you know, if you are, there's a kind of a Lamarckian sort of like you are deformed by your idleness um, and therefore, and then you can then pass on that kind of deformity somehow, um, which takes on the character of ugliness. But I also love the part about the neighbors can't stand it. They're just like, no, we're, like, we're, we're intervening here. We, we, we can't have any ugliness here, right? And that's again, such a Morris idea um, that that's the you know, beauty above all, above all else. So, and we were, we were talking in our breakout room about gender and sexuality about the beauty question too. So maybe we'll come back to that when we when we get to that topic. But um, yeah, so the idleness as disease thing, it, it's super emblematic of the function or methodology, the way that Morris is envisioning this social change as a whole, right? Because it's like through successive generations, right? And this goes back to that question of like, how do you quote unquote breed, I'm using that word advisedly, <laughs> how do you breed, you know, uh, denizens of a utopia? Like how do you, um, you know, even in the How the Change Came chapter, guest, uh, sorry, Hammond does acknowledge that it was really hard for the intervening generations, you know, after the revolution came and before everything was as wonderful as it is now, there was like a whole period where people were just kind of like, it was really difficult and, there was a whole the number of generations that made these sacrifices only by thinking about what the possible future might be, never getting to see it. It's like, you know, it's like Moses, right? It's like, well, you get to envision this future for your people, but you don't get to actually um, participate in it or enjoy it. Um, and so that's like a really a kind of, I think there's something there about that too, that like, um, the transition period, right? Where things are gonna be ugly, like literally and metaphorically is kind of captured in that passage too. Um, what about the scarcity of labor thing? That was super, I think that's one of the most interesting things about this novel, right? Is the, uh, you know, you keep getting these little hints um, from various people that Guest talks to up until he finally meets up with, um, uh, Ham I keep forgetting Hammond's name. After he finally meets up with Hammond, and he learns more about it, but but in that the the travels to get to Hammond, he comes across several people who hint at this anxiety uh, that labor is going to dry up, right? That there's not going to be any more pleasant labor left, or we're not going to we're all kind of worrying that there won't be enough work or whatever. Um, and then he comes to understand that they don't mean like that people are worried there's not gonna be enough work as in I'm not gonna be able to make enough money to pay my rent, right? Cause that's not the way things work, but rather that labor is enjoyable. And so everybody wants to do it. And so therefore people are anxious about scarcity, right? Any thoughts about that? 
or just about the way work labor is envisioned in the society in general? I'd like to say something. Um, I don't know. I think William Morris read his Marx in French and in English, we never really had translated up until the time when I went to college, which was in like the eight, 1980s. Uh, David McClellan did an, a new translation which brought to the fore some of Marx's early writings, which mm -hmm. hitherto were not translated into English. And mm -hmm. the most important one was 1848 manuscripts in which he discusses alienation theory of mm -hmm. labor value. And it contains a marvelous passage at the beginning of it where he discusses labor as ideal day. The guy goes fishing in the morning. He reads a book in the afternoon. And this is, I think, very close to what Morris was looking for, where work was pleasurable. You wanted it. It was not onerous. It's, of course, a direct contradiction to the fact that you're start most people were starving to death and were forced to work for a mm -hmm. for money, you know, and um, so Mark and this is this is a this is you know this is a lovely part of Marx. He goes on to talk about species being, which is some kind of quasi mystical communion with your fellow man and nature mm -hmm. embodied in work, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, so that's just lovely parts of Marx, uh, mm -hmm. much better than the Das Kapital, you know, where he works it all out in a cut and dry manner. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, there's um, the the stuff about labor being pleasant, but also this other kind of little piece of it too, which is um, that that we have to wrestle with nature, right? So there's, it's it's almost kind of contradictory. Um, I mean, obviously Marx that's central to Marx's thought, right? This, the, the notion that, um, that we're at war with nature and right. we are, you know, and we, that, that is just what we, that's our legacy as human beings is that we have to fight our environment in order to survive, in order to prosper, et cetera. Um, we, you know, it's not, uh, it's almost a kind of anti-romantic idea, right? Um, and so I think that's part of it too, right? Is it's like, there are a couple of mentions just in passing. And again, if you're not like really attuned to thinking about the Marxist background of it, you might not even notice these throwaway lines about like, you know, Hammond says something about like, we we're, we fight with nature or we have to wrestle nature. I think he uses the word wrestle at one point. Um, and so it does seem like almost contradictory, right? We're wrestling nature and yet we're still finding our labor pleasant, right? Um, I mean, I think there's like one of my favorite scenes in this whole novel, which I just think is so funny. And then I know we, we should probably then move on to the to the next topic because I don't want to spend too much time and not uh, give short shrift to the others. But um, one of my favorite um, passages in this novel is the is the one where he sees the pleasure party of road building, right? <laughs> like, and it's like the description of it just sounds exactly like a kind of a picnic, you know, a party a, ple a party of pleasure, right? Um, and of course, again, we have like the women watching and preparing the picket basket and like they're like shouting encouragement from the side. No, you know, the women aren't picking up any pickaxes or whatever, but the men are, you know, they've got their shirt sleeves, they've got their, their jackets, um, you know, stacked by the side of the road and they're like having fun building this road. Um, and it's almost like, you know, Morris is trying to envision a world in which like that's what you do for fun instead of hunting or whatever, instead of like getting in a boat or, you know, going on a, on a picnic. Um, so he's kind of trying to sell it pretty hard here, right? This idea that somehow uh, things will become pleasurable, but it's also like, I think a really, really key part of that and to go back to the Marx is like, yeah, without alienation, right? Like, you know, this is how old Hammond tries to explain it. It's like you, if you are, taking pleasure and you can take pleasure in what you are producing if you are not, you know, if it's something that you want to do, it's something that you have a, a kind of a connection to, you don't even work connection, but you know what I mean? If it's something um, like artisanal work or work that you just, like he says that somebody will take pleasure in organizing or pe people just want to be like managers or they like, you know, whatever. And I think we can probably all relate to that. Like, you know, it sometimes it's extremely satisfying to just like clean up your house or whatever. And then you get to like, you know, enjoy the the fruits of your of your labor or whatever. So I think that's what he's talking about here is when you're doing it. I think you're exactly right to hone in on the idea of alienation. Unalienated labor is potentially pleasant, right? Or potentially 
Um, but the question, and I think this is another one of those moments when he doesn't quite go as far as one might want him to, uh, the question still of like, how do you get people to work? Right. And this is from the capitalist perspective, right? Like the, we think of this as human nature, but really it's just like kind of a human nature of who? Human nature of people growing up in capitalism. Uh, hard for us to imagine like how you get people to work if they don't have to. Like, why wouldn't they just, you know, this is always um, the kind of, you know, standard critique. Like why, why wouldn't people just live off of the labor of other people? Why, you know, why, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think there's also something here about scarcity and abundance in general, that like, this is, and this also kind of goes back to Ruskin, maybe, right? The, the idea that, you know, it is an economics of abundance and it's, a, it's an economics that imagines that we are wrestling with nature, but also that, that the, the our products of nature are, are fruit, you know, that, that, that the world is abundant, that it's not interested in focusing on scarcity. Um, and it's interesting then that scarcity gets reinscribed as a scarcity of labor. It's almost like Morris is like, can't quite get there. He's like, can't quite, can't quite imagine a, an economic organization in which nothing is scarce, right? Um, and so the thing that's scarce is pleasant labor. Um, actually, my other real favorite passage um, is, uh, is the one about America, the stinking dung heap of, <laughs> of America. Um, let me see if I can find it real quick. I didn't write it down this page number, but I'm just remembering it. Right uh. um, I'm just gonna do a search for it in the... Okay, so it's the very, very end of chapter XV, 15. My little Roman numeral translation here. Um, I'll find the page number for you here in a second. It's on the lack of incentive to labor in a communist society, that chapter. Uh, so in the, if you've got the Oxford, it's page 85. And um, I'm just clicking back over here. Uh, it's the very, very end of the chapter. So um, he's, this is where he's explaining the anxiety about the fact that labor might dry up, right? That there will be a scarcity of labor. Um, he says, guest asks him, do you think that there's any fear of a work famine amongst you? Which is an interesting question to ask because at least four people have said to him, we're all worried about a work famine. <laughs> I don't even know why he's bothering to ask. Yes, it's obviously a concern. That's the whole point. That's why Morris has been making these characters say this. Um, but Hammond says, um, no, I do not, said he. And I will tell you why. It is each man's business to make his own work pleasanter and pleasanter. Um, there's such a vast number of things which can be treated as works of art that this alone gives employment to a host of deaf people. So I just think it's, it's such a fascinating moment. It's like, well, you can just put more decorations on anything, right? <laughs> That's, like if you, if you run out of stuff to do, you can just carve some more stuff, right? Or just put some more gold on things or whatever. And so that's why everything is so ornate, right? Everyone's jackets have brocade and whatever, and the pipes are all carved and with gemstones. And anyway, um, this alone gives an employment to a host of deft people. Again, if art be inexhaustible, so is science also. Interesting kind of side note there, right? That science has a kind of a, you know, again, this very Victorian idea of it as a gentleman's pursuit. You just like wake up one morning, you're George Henry Lewis, and you're like, I think I'm a cell biologist now. <laughs> no problem. I'm just going to get some tough tubes and I'm good to go. Um, so, you know, people just kind of like dabbling in, in, in these other pursuits. But then jumping ahead a little bit, again, as more and more of pleasure is imported into work, I think we shall take up kinds of work which produce desirable wares, but which we gave up because we could not carry them on pleasantly. Moreover, I think that it is only in parts of Europe, which are more advanced than the rest of the world, that you will hear this talk of the fear of a work famine. Those lands which were once the colonies of Great Britain, for instance, and especially America, that part of it above all, which was once the United States, are now and will be for a long while a great resource to us. For the, the, these lands, and I say, especially the Northern parts of America, suffered so terribly from the full force of the last days of civilization and became such horrible places to live in that they are now very backward in all that makes life pleasant. Indeed, one may say that for nearly a hundred years, the people of the Northern parts of America have been engaged in gradually making a dwelling place out of a stinking dust heap. And there is a, still a great deal to do, especially as the country is so big. So another nice little jab <laughs> at the US. Um, but 
such an interesting idea, right? That like, again, uh, we need to outsource, right? So it's, it's like, I think that passage is so fascinating because like if, if the usual 19th century anxiety is, we are going to run out of either things, right? Uh, raw materials, right? So therefore, and, and in that case, uh, the colonies are a resource to us, right? Um, or markets, and, and right, and Old Hammond talks quite a lot about that, the anxiety that you're not going to have enough people to sell. And, the, and it's, they're weirdly paradoxical, right? It's like, we're going to run out of stuff, and we're also going to run out of people to consume this stuff. Um, and in both cases, the answer is the colonies, right, that we're going to outsource this. And here, in a, in a social organization, which Morris is imagining that, that labor becomes scarce, the colonies are still, even uses the word resource, right? It's like, yeah, we can just, or even like we have immigration, we have too many people, we'll just ship them over to the colony. So it's like always just kind of this like midden, you know, this like place where you either like, get rid of stuff that you don't have room for, or you find some stuff that you need or whatever. Um, but even in this ideal society, he can't quite let go of that, that knee jerk habit of thinking of the colonies as, as a place like that. Um, so yeah, so let's, and. Well, obviously, we're going to have another session on this, and we'll we'll, we'll circle back to some of these topics because, like I said, you're, there's going to be more uh, stuff happening in the in the novel that we'll touch on on these topics as well. So, maybe let's move on um, to the second. Well, actually, let's do the third one, which was art, because uh, I'm going to save the gender one for last because that, that was the one I was involved in. So, um, who was talking about art and architecture and history and literature? We had we found a passage um, in which is near the beginning. It's the second paragraph in chapter three mm -hmm. about the guest house, and I will read that for people. Great. It's called. It's uh, heading heading is an interior. However, all this I took in in a minute, for we were presently within doors and standing in a hall with a floor of marble mosaic and an open timber roof. There were no windows on the side opposite to the river, but arches below leading into chambers, one of which showed a glimpse of a garden beyond, and above them a long space of wall, gaily painted, in fresco, I thought, with similar subjects to those of the frieze outside. Everything about the place was handsome and generously solid as to material, and though it was not very large, somewhat smaller than Crosby Hall, perhaps, one felt in it that exhilarating sense of space and freedom, which satisfactory architecture always gives to an unanxious man who was in the habit of using his eyes. So we thought that was a nice way, you know, to be, take your time, look at things. Good Mara's telling, giving us a little bit of advice. <laughs> and, um, and then I think you pick up in that passage um, uh, that he, even though he was a man of prodigious talents and energies, he liked simple things too. You know, he was not um, bigger is better. And perhaps that he, um, he, he, he want, I think he, he, there's some quotation, you'll remember it probably where he says, simplicity in all things is not terrible. It's not tragic. It's, mm -hmm. it's the very thing of life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I find fascinating about Morris is that even though he had he was had this tendency for extraordinary ornamentation and and, and exuberance, yet he saw the power of simplicity and and, and simpleness. Mm -hmm. He wanted things to be work functional. You know, you, you couldn't have something that wasn't functional, and that's important. It wasn't idle aestheticism. It was everyday things, tools that you use. Your kitchen his, implement. I, yeah, and I think that that quotation, the, the whole thing about the pipe, right, really captures this kind of like, it's almost, how does he feel about that pipe? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, does he, he's kind of ambivalent about it. Um, it's beautiful. He's, he feels really weird. I'm talking about like guest now, who is, of course, the stand-in for Morris, but he feels really weird about taking it. First of all, he just can't get over the fact that, that you know, it's such an incredibly valuable looking object and somebody's just giving it to him. Um, but I don't know, just, 
he thinks it's maybe a little bit too much carving, a little bit too many, you know, too many gems or just, he calls it frippery at one point, right? Um, so yeah, how do we, how do we jibe that? This is kind of related to the passage that you picked out as well, right? Um, the, the, the kind of, the, what's so wonderful about that passage is this idea of like, of the unanxious man, like, <laughs> um, we can, we'll unpack that in a second, but, um, yeah, it's an exhilarating sense of space and freedom that like these are, th these kind of ex aesthetic experiences have deep psychological uh, effects, right? Uh, giving you a, a kind of, you know, a, a sense of well-being almost. And so these are not idle questions, like how much carving is appropriate on a pipe? Like it's not, you know, it's 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 symbolic of kind of this larger set of questions that, that really interests him. Um, yeah, what does, what, what do you all make of that? the the business about the pipe and about the the just kind of his general attitude toward ornamentation shall we say it's a little bit confusing maybe are you asking uh, i i Every, I, I said what i have to say i'd like to hear other people i hope you weren't directing that at me no 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 i'm, I'm this is i'm opening this up to everybody well, I think what you're saying about the pipe, Diana, for me, connects to um, the way that he dismisses so many, you know, what we think of as fantastic mid-Victorian buildings. Right, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. He clearly doesn't One like building Gothic after another is, is hideous, and you're like, oh, no. <laughs> really, the British Museum? <laughs> yeah. And so it's almost kind of asking us to, to completely invert our aesthetic value system, um, and that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, and so you, when we imagine the pipe, you know, we imagine this beautiful thing. And so it's quite shocking to us when, um, when guest is told, well, you know, if you lose it, you lose it, somebody else will pick it up and use it. <laughs> um, right. you know, that's a strange way to think about property, but it's also a strange way to think about something so beautiful that has taken so much labor. Yes. Um, so there's yeah. something really challenging going on. Yeah. I mean, I think. Part of it is we learn only much later that people are just like doing this because they need something to do. <laughs> they need something to do. So in a way, it's like it is devalued, right? It's like it's it's a weird. It's um, there's so much ornamentation, and everybody is doing it, and everybody can do it. We're told at one point that like everybody can do carving, like that's you know that's nothing. Um, I guess once you're once you're freed up from doing manual labor or other kinds of labor to make money or to support yourself and you can just do whatever you want you kind of take to things like I guess people are better artisans as well as being better looking right in, in the future um but yeah it's like it's it's almost devalued because it's so commonplace it's almost it becomes like what does ornament even mean now when it's everywhere it becomes yeah and so but I think you're right like the buildings that he admires he always describes them as simple they're um you know they're not they're not the ones with the ornamentation or the ostentatiousness about them. They're the ones that are, are, are airy is a kind of a favorite word of his. And yeah, um, it is an interesting question. So- I mean, the furniture he designed for Red House, for instance, was just solid, stodgy. I mean, it's very functional and not, yeah. there's not you know, it's very heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, and, and, and especially that tithe barn, that's just massive stones. You know, it's just a very huge, beautiful, beautifully built, long lasting building, well built mm -hmm. and still, you know, still usable after all this time, which is great. That's, I think, what he was after. And the mm -hmm. ornamentation part. Well, yes, it's nice, but, you know, you shouldn't get stuck on it. You know, he hated, be, you know, producing luxury goods for rich people. He, he mm -hmm. thought that they were swine and he yeah. wants things to be nice for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that people would, so that, yes, it's a nice object, but you want, maybe, you know, mustn't get stuck on this nice object. You must make mm -hmm. other nice objects and give that one away once mm -hmm. you made it. Yeah, there's this interesting moment, right, where he talks about, <clears throat> I think it's actually, it's in the passage where Guest is talking about how they actually run things, right? How they have their, like, their meetings and that kind of like laborious process of like, we have a meeting and then we have another, there's a majority and there's a minority and then this meeting. Um, but the example that he gives of like a question that they might debate is, should we pull down this hideous iron bridge and build a stone bridge instead, right? Um, and that's of course like very Ruskinian, you know, that's the idea, like let's have a, a kind of a neo-Gothic structure here. Um, but it's also like, yeah, like, like 
going back right back to Ruskin, that idea like rudeness and um, you know the, the the sort of seeing the chisel marks from the artisan or is like that's a kind of beauty, whatever. Um, so yeah, so I think the pipe is the pipe is a bit of a red herring, maybe, right? Like we're it's it's meant to be an object that gives us the occasion to reflect on what we think we know what we think the status of that kind of ornamentation is. Um, but it just, I just think it's so funny because like Guest's attitude toward it is so contemptuous in a way. Like he's, I mean, he's overwhelmed by it. He thinks it's too beautiful, but then he starts thinking of it almost immediately as this kind of piece of, like you say, like a, a kind of a stupid plaything for rich people or whatever, even though it, that, that, that um, value system doesn't exist in this world, he hasn't quite let go of that as well. Um, what about literature? Did you all talk about literature at all in your art group? Well, let's let's throw that. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut. Was there, were there other topics or passages that that you all talked about that you wanted to bring to the group as a whole? Okay, let's let's talk about literature for just a bit. And there's going to be more. There's going to be a lot more about it. Like um, for those of you who maybe have already read this novel before or who read the whole thing, um, there's actually quite a spirited debate about the point of literature that comes up later in the book. Um, so we will again revisit this question, but I kind of wanted to, a lot of these questions are just like are introducing and like talking through so that we can actually notice the way that they're unfolding for the rest of the book when you finish it. Um, there's a couple of places where literature comes up, right? First of all, of course, is the character of Boffin. We have to talk about Boffin because we're the Dickens group. <laughs> um, how many, did anybody have any thoughts about the character of Boffin? Like, and, and the kind of like general, there's a couple of shout outs to Dickens here, right? There's, I think he, he comes up several times, um, but Boffin in particular, the dustman at the beginning. Why, do you remember what, why, like he's called Boffin because he's, um, because he really wants to know, let's just find the passage actually. It's on page 19 of the Oxford edition. And that's in chapter, um, it's in chapter three, toward the very end, I would say about a page from the end of chapter three. So it starts, the paragraph starts, Dick laughed. Dick laughed, yes, yes, said he. Um, I see you take the illusion, meaning he gets that it's an illusion to our um, Rachel friend. Of course, his real name is not Boffin, but Henry Johnson, we only call him Boffin as a joke, partly because he is a dustman, and partly, be, and again, and this is one of these moments where guests is like the dustman dressed this way, right? Cause he's got the super ornate um, brocade outfit and everything. Um, partly because he will dress so showily and get as much gold on him as a baron of the middle ages. As why should he not if he likes? Only we are his special friends, you know, so of course we jest with him. I held my tongue for some time after that, but Dick went on. He is a capital fellow and you can't help liking him, but he has a weakness. He will spend his time in writing reactionary novels and is, very, <laughs> and is very proud of getting the local color right, as he calls it. And as he thinks you come from some forgotten corner of the earth where people are unhappy and consequently, un, and consequently interesting to a storyteller, he thinks he might get some information out of you. Oh, he will be quite straightforward with you for that matter, only for your own comfort, beware of him. Um, and then Jimmy had a little bit, birds of a feather flock together, Math mathematics and antiquarian novels stand on much the same footing. Uh, that's why Boffin gets along with um, the friend, I forget his name, the person that's at the very beginning. Um, anyway, so, okay. So what's going on? <laughs> I think it called, I think one of the interesting things here is that the idea of like, you need unhappiness to be able to have a novel, which we'll talk about more in a second. But um, wh what about the reactionary novels bit? Again, this is going to be developed later, but I just want to kind of have an in initial conversation about it because I think it's such a, it's a kind of a key idea for Morris. I think I'm curious about like what his reactionary novels are reacting to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I guess, I mean, I assume he means reactionary in the way that he means it when he, we get to the, how the change came, like politically reactionary as in like, um, uh, you know, the, Corey, <laughs> you know, like uh, conservative, old, you know, uh, advocating the old system or whatever. But you're right. I mean, it's a weird word to use in this context. Like when when Hammond uses it, 
he's specifically referring to it's very precise meaning like he's talking about the revolutionary process he gives us that long narrative which i you know it's so many details it's like crazy um way more information than we want right now <laughs> about how the change came um but he's using it really precisely to mean like the reactionary forces were the government and the police and the army and the and the rich people right the, they're the they're reactionary because they are reacting against the the revolution but in this context does it you're right does it mean just like generally kind of conservative or generally or like the way you know a Maoist would use that term, like reactionary as in like capitalist running dogs or you know whatever um a, probably something like that but yeah yeah I got something I want to say, which is not specific to Mars, but it's something I read recently that may be related. Um, there was an article in New York Times about, or maybe it was, I don't know it was elsewhere, it was TLS, about um, a Russian, about Gogol and his going out and talking to the peasants and then capturing their speech. Mm. And I think what's going on here is, is that um, for, a, for this to make it into a novel written by someone in an educated class, that you would then go out into the countryside and give a little bit of local color. And there are all sorts of problems that arise, whether you try to mimic the dialect, you know, into something like a Thomas Hardy novel, whether you, you know, exactly what spirit you are going out into, <laughs> into the hilter, hinterlands to capture, to get a little, are you a, a, a literary voyeur going to, you know, to, to mingle with the, the, the farmers and the, the field hands? What exactly is going on there? How does it get represented? If it gets into literary language, what literary language is used? Is it, you have to use some, you know, archaic older terms that are that are used to talk about very specific agricultural implements and so on. How you know that there's a whole thing, whole very interesting linguistic um, issues that are raised with with this kind of problem. That is a great example. I think that's pretty much kind of exactly what Morris is talking about, right? Like Boffin, Boffin is, um, he's writing these reactionary novels. So he's writing novels about the olden times, right? He's writing novels about the way the world was before. Um, he's like, you know, it's like Walter Scott or something. He's writing like these historical fictions that are about, um, with characters that are from the, you know, capitalism or from civilization the way it was before. And so, He's yeah, he's, he's he's like excited to meet somebody he thinks is from a place where people are still unhappy uh, because he needs he needs. Yeah, he's going to like ha listen to the way he talk, mine him for information and details or whatever. Um, but I just like that little throwaway moment when he says. Um, where the, um, some forgo forgotten corner of the earth where people are unhappy and consequently interesting to a storyteller. I just think there's a lot of moments like that where Morris basically just kind of like says, I know this novel is boring. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, I know that this is like a lot of, you know, utopian fiction is not page turning because there's like, there's not a lot of, lots of incident in it because people are not interesting when they're, un when they're happy. Or at least it's not interesting to a novelist, right? Like you can't, and like I said, later on, there's gonna be a whole debate about that, like between two characters, which makes it even more kind of foregrounds it even more. But, but you know, and then there's some, the moment we talked about before when Clara says like, I wish that somebody, I wish that stuff happened to us so that people would think it would be really interesting to write down our stories, right? Um, so yeah, it's like, a, it's almost a kind of like a little shout out to the, the reader. Like, I know there's not a lot going on here, but you know, it's still, you still, and honestly, like, you know, he's, he write, he's written other, um, not so stri such straight up utopian novels. Like this, you know, this novel, as I talked about last time, is a direct reaction to Edward Bellamy's Look Backward. So it's like very self-consciously a utopian novel. But he's written other novels that are utopian-ish that are way more boring than this one. <laughs> like, the would be on the world is just unreadable. Like, just really like he's, and he's kind of like not, he's like, yeah, not, you know, he gets it, but he's not going to do anything about it, sort of thing. Um, but I think it's it's related to that question of ornament, you know, like um, ornament is a, you know, along with narratability, or maybe like things that you we will naturally fall away in the and history too. That's another thing I really want to talk about next time um, is what is the status of history. I mean, half the novel or more is 
guest interacting with an historian, you know, somebody who like remembers the past and and what is and everybody thinks it's ridiculous. Like, ugh, there's this one guy who like remembers stuff and cares about it. Nobody else bothers to learn history. Uh, what what do we need that for? And so I think it's a really interesting question as well that kind of is related to to all these. Um, let's uh, unless do people have other things they want to share with or thoughts they have about like the status of art or um the novel literature before we move on i don't want to cut anybody off if there's other thoughts okay let's let's move on to our our third topic then it was the one that the group that i was in which is the um gender gender sexuality etc so i'll let somebody else, <laughs> not me. Um, I think oh, Nancy and yeah, there's Nancy and Renee were the two other people in the group. So I don't know if, if either one of you would like to just share a little bit about what we talked about. Nancy, why don't you go ahead? Oh, I'm completely tongue tied. Um, <laughs> I think we we talked, uh, I remember talking about how it struck me that he seemed to have dispensed with sexual tension, sexual violence, domestic violence, all that stuff that is so hard for us right now. Um, and I, I, maybe that's, and I didn't really say that in the group, but maybe that's part of what makes utopian literature um, I don't know that I haven't read a lot of utopian literature, but uh, uh, of the fact that he kept the whole thing about original sin. And I just kept thinking, what would Freud and theologians make of all this? You know, that, that those were those, the, the human condition is, was created by external factors and is really not something inside of us, um, sin but is really just created by these horrible external factors that luckily this society has gotten rid of and therefore people don't grapple with those things. I guess mm -hmm. I'm, you can say that much better, Renee, go for it. <laughs> no, I think that you, I think that you did that fantastically. I mean, we, you know, we, we kind of had a conversation about it in, in terms of um, the human nature question also that, that Dee had brought up earlier and just kind of what it, you know, what it, what it means to, you know, to think about there being no such thing as human nature and only being something called human nurture, but also, um, you know, what that means in terms of thinking about universal instincts versus individual instincts and, and just how, how this novel like allied so many questions about individual individuality. Um, um, and we were talking about that specifically in relation to, you know, the questions of domestic violence and its absence, or, you know, how, you know, how, a, how, how one can envision a world in which the, the very kind of particular um, individual circumstances that produce those kinds of violences somehow just don't exist if you also and of they are insisting that you know there is such a thing as nurture and that you know there is no real kind of universal way of being in the world so so that was a, a that was a little bit of a tangential conversation we had um but then the other thing that we ended up talking about in relation to um to the idea of there you know the the, the fiction that there's no kind of um uh gendered power dynamics in here is um, we were talking about um, a passage about housekeeping and um, and about, you know, on the one hand, the idea that, you know, this the the text proposes uh, proposes an equality of labor in the, you know, in the feminist sense where domestic labor is just as valued and important as other kinds of labor. And that's one, you know, kind of particularly radical um, feminist position, position that it takes. But then in contrast to that, particularly radical feminist position, it also presents housekeeping as a thing that women are doing still to please people and still to, you know, to inspire the gratitude of the people who live with them. And that there's something, um, there's something about that, that, that suggests that the fiction of inequality of labor remains just as fictional here as it did anywhere else. And sort of how to, how to deal with that idea of, of women doing this work to, to please people. Um, and then the the kind of attendant to that that I was sort of thinking about is like, what happens if it's not pleasing to people? Like, what happens if they don't please the people and the people aren't grateful? Like, how you know what? How do you sort of again think through that 
that logical progression where if your work is meant to please people and it and it doesn't suddenly power dynamics are like are all over the place even if we're not imagining them to be present and what if yeah, and sorry, what if that that work that you're doing that housework is not an enjoyable or pleasurable to do right so if work is supposed to be pleasurable then there's that added dimension as well like how could you not feel uh bitter doing something that you don't want to do if it's not appreciated by others mm -hmm. it almost seems as though the suggestion because i i guess just to just to um, touch on what you're saying courtney it's like if all work is now pleasurable right like he just like just says you know like that just seems to be like um a given uh he doesn't really go into a lot of detail about what about it. We, he does a little bit, right? He says, like we've talked about before, the um, a sense of autonomy, like having a connection to the thing that you're that you are producing or doing, um, having an investment in it, being non alienated, right? But if for women that uh, set of functions is all about pleasing other people, as Renee pointed out, uh, it's no longer that kind of like, you know, if all that rhetoric around labor for, for male quote unquote labor is about, um, you know, taking pride in your work or whatever, it's, it's a different, like you, yeah, you're dependent on someone else and the, their whims, <laughs> right? And again, people seem kind of cranky, like there's a lot of crankiness in this novel. So like, if people are like that short tempered, then, you know, I, I wouldn't want to have to be dependent on my only source of pleasure in my work is is making them happy, right? That seems sort of a little tenuous. I think it's a really good point. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll just take a, just to point out this passage for the people who weren't in our group. It's um, the one that Renee is specifically referring to. It's on page fifty two in the Oxford edition, and it's chapter um, it's chapter nine, the one called "Concerning Love," and uh, I'd say it's about two pages from the end of. Um, from the end of the chapter. So guest says, what about this woman question? I saw at the guest house that women were waiting on the men. That seems a little like reaction, doesn't it? And again, that I, that word reactionary or reaction, uh, reaction against the, the revolution, right? Um, supposedly. Does it, said the old man, perhaps you think housekeeping an unimportant occupation, not deserving of respect. I believe that was the opinion of the advanced women of the 19th century and their male backers. If it is yours, I rec recommend to your notice an old Norwegian folklore, et cetera. And he talks about that folk tale, though there's a footnote about it. Um, but he, he basically says, like, the problem is, and again, this is a kind of a throwaway moment, but pretty important. The problem is that this work is devalued. And we talked in our group about how, like, this is a kind of, you know, a, a, a hallmark of cultural feminism that goes back to the 19th century, right? The separate spheres ideology. Uh, there was a, you know, kind of an outshoot, like earliest feminist discourse that came straight out of the separate series ideology that was basically trying to say, like, women's power is in the home, is in their domestic chores, and in um, making a pleasing household and also rearing children, right, that they're, they're the moral center of the family and of the society, and that, therefore, we're the best. <laughs> Was kind of was kind of the rhetoric, right? I mean, we still have that, right? I was like, when I was like talk about this with my students, I'm like, we still have that kind of like women up on a pedestal. I worship women, kind of you know rhetoric in our culture, um, and so that like that was the source of women's uh, that was to be the source of women's power, and that was like the earliest kind of feminist discourse. So I think Morris is kind of like working right in that vein. That said, it is actually right a, an important critique it's and this also comes out of marxist fem feminism as well to say that this unremunerated domestic labor should be valued more like you know and as we're saying like in an, in an ideal non-patriarchal society everyone could make the decision to be a stay-at-home parent with kids or to be a housekeeper um house manager or whatever um or to do any kind of labor at all if they're equally valued um, socially and culturally, then there wouldn't have to be that kind of, you know, denigration or whatever. Um, and so the the old man in this case is saying like, what, you looking down on women because they prefer house housework? But then Renee's point is like, but why does it just happen to be only women who want to do it? <laughs> like, why is it like, why are there no men who are like, you know, 
offering plates of strawberries or whatever the heck the women are doing? Or, you know, why is, I mean, Guest is pretty lecherous about the men as well, but he does spend a lot more time looking at the women and he comments on their appearance constantly. So this idea that like women are meant to be pleasing and they're especially meant to be aesthetically pleasing, right? Brings us right back to the whole question of ornamentation that like women are aesthetic objects as well. Anyway, I've been talking too much. Um, any, let's just open it up. Any other comments or thoughts about gender or or love, sexuality, kind of all of the the kind of discussion of the relationships between the sexes. And again, as we said in my group, it's Morris's only conception of a sexual relationship is obviously a heterosexual one. I wanted to go back to um, a passage. That I think it was Andrew who talked about the uh, uh, the guest house and the pleasure that uh, uh, guest takes in observing the architecture, mm -hmm. and it's it's that uh, reference to the pleasure which satisfactory architecture always gives to an unanxious mm -hmm. man who is in the habit of using his eyes. And I was really struck by that unanxious man. Um, and I, it, the connection that I want to make to gender sexuality is the thing that Deanna, you ob observed, and I'm sure others as well, that Guest spends a lot of time looking at women and enjoying their physical beauty. Um, and is he an unanxious man in observing and taking pleasure in the female form? Or is he something of a lech here? And I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that I, as a male reader of this text, enjoyed the absence of sexualization in his pleasure about observing women. But uh, I, I suspect that there may be female readers who, who felt that there was a touch of anxiety in that. So anyway, I wanted to raise the question. Uh, Morris clearly appreciates beauty and uh, is his appreciation of, of beauty gendered uh, and how much anxiety lies behind it? Thoughts? I, I have some things to say, but I want to hear what other people have to say first. <laughs> Is this the power of the male gaze? Mm. Oh, oh, I think Andrew, yeah, Andrew, you were talking about- I'm sorry, I muted myself. Yeah. I had need yeah. to leave fairly shortly, so I was getting ready to go. But I just wanted to say, I, I take issue with the idea that you think the Morris doesn't have any homoerotic elements to his love. I mean, because oh. he, you know, he look at the guys he hung out with. They were all guys. He, he associated with a lot of guys. He obviously, he obviously enjoyed their companionship you know, and um, his wife was extraordinarily beautiful. They, all those pre-Raphaelites just found these exquisite women. Um, and um, they did indeed try to sort of spiritualize them into some ideal form, but I'm sure they had fun as well. I mean, they weren't, <laughs> didn't, they had bodies, you know, they had babies um, and they were quite, Morris in particular was very playful. And who knows who did the dishes? You know, we should find out. Uh, but they, he was certainly very tolerant when when Rossetti took up with his wife. And, you know, they all lived together for a long time before it mm -hmm. got to be a bit much and he mm -hmm. booted him out. Um, mm -hmm. So. Oh, yeah, let me clarify. Absolutely. Yes, Morris. I mean, this novel is very, there's tons of homoeroticism and tons of homosociality. In, in this novel and in Morris's life and in the, the victor, yeah, totally. All I meant was that the only s sanctioned sexual relationships are heterosexual. Like the only, the only actual pairings that are, you know, discussed openly in this novel. Um, and I'm not even, I, don't, I wouldn't even want to extend that to as long as, as far as to say that in Morris's own life, again, who knows, like, you know, 
we have lots and lots and lots of examples of people who live their lives very differently than they were willing to actually depict in novel, you know, like put on paper. So for sure, yeah, I wanna make that clear. Um, and, and this kind of goes back to John's question, right? Like Guest stares at and admires men a lot too. I mean, there's a lot of like well-knit, cleanly men and, you know, like the, the, the beauty of those, um, the men uh, doing the road work and all that. So he, he has a gaze for men as well. I think it's different. I personally feel like the way, you know, the, the descriptions of the way that guest looks at women, like for example, like the moment when uh, they leave the horse with that beautiful young woman and they go into the shop and they come back out and, and it's, she's been, she's gone and there's an old man there. And just the whole like, kind of like, oh, well, of course that's sad. And, you know, we, we, there's a little joke about how, de how depressing it is to have to come back to see this old man. And even the old man knows it and they have a little exchange looks or whatever. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, mutual understanding that yes, we all take pleasure in, in beauty and in beautiful objects, et cetera. And he does talk in general about how like everybody in the society is better looking than they used to be, <laughs> not just women. Um, and that's super important. Like everybody wants to only look at beautiful people, um, which is, you know, disturbing enough. It doesn't even have to be gendered. It's disturbing anyway. <laughs> like, it's pretty ableist and it's pretty- Are um... you celebrating the ugly? <laughs> Are you going to stand up now for the grotesque with the ugly? I mean- <laughs> it... Long live ugly. Long live <laughs> ugly, exactly. Ugly and, and beautiful. Yes. Exactly. And, and it doesn't exactly jive, right? If like we're to find beauty in these rough hewn, simple, solid objects, doesn't right? That work. have this kind of marks about them that are ugly, but beautiful, then, you know, why not the same thing about people? Um, he doesn't, you could, I mean, actually, I think there is a scene later on where I, he talks about, um, yeah, he, he does talk about older people, like having a kind of beauty about them, right? Where he's like, you know, they look like this 90 year old people, which is like unimaginably old for Morris's time, um, you know, looking solid and strong and all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, there's maybe there is an element of that too, but but certainly he, he, the full weight of it falls on the women characters for sure, for sure. And I think it goes to what Renee was saying about, about pleasing, right? That like their job is is still very much in this kind of non-economy economy, their labor is to please on some level and whereas you know the, the men are not depicted in that same way so i guess that maybe goes to john's question um i wouldn't i guess like my answer would be i don't think the descriptions of beautiful women are disturbing in and of themselves but maybe in context in the fact that he's landing so heavily on this idea of women's labor being to be pleasant and pleasing and um you know the kind of the, the, the unexamined idea that only women are going to want to do housework, that like, sure, there's nothing innate about that, but yet it somehow shakes out that all the women want to be house managers and all the men want to do road work or whatever. Um, that's just an accident. <laughs> um, so I would say as part of that complex of issues that maybe it's a little, um, it's a little more um, unsavory, but, but I take your point that like the, yeah, I mean, who doesn't want to hear about beauty? <laughs> so like, yeah, the descriptions of the beautiful buildings and the beautiful people are maybe kind of all of the piece in a sense, right? That there's like that real pleasure in that. Other thoughts? And I, just one other comment about that. I think I think this goes back to Ruskin. That, that yeah, Yes. Uh, this is about the education of the eye and how the beholder can be trained or can learn uh, to, to contemplate. Mm -hmm. and yes. appreciate um, and yeah. that uh, that itself is is a is a value that needs to be recognized and 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 appreciated I think that's exactly right and I think that um it's also part of the education of desire in general remember that phrase that I was talking about last time that is the work of utopia right that like we're you know we're we're thinking about how to create on some really deep level, we're thinking about how to create human beings <laughs> that are fitted for this utopian social organization. And part of the compensatory work of that utopia, as Morris envisions it, is, is, is aesthetic, right? It's like beauty is, um, be, yeah, beauty is a kind of universal currency, or that's the way it works anyway in this novel. Uh, 
there isn't money and you know there isn't even barter so this is this is what we have and it's almost like a social contract like that weird passage about how the the neighbors are just like oh we can't stand this ugliness anymore you have to stop being so lazy because you're producing ugly children we have to take matters into hand here because this is the one thing that's unacceptable is ugliness um and so it's almost like a kind of a a duty we owe one another right in a way but again it's like you know, as a 21st century reader, I'm disturbed by that because it is like, you know, pretty restrictive <laughs> of on human beings. But, um, but, but it is, yeah. But Morris is certainly picturing it as part of this kind of uh, education, education of desire, education of the eye, education, uh, turning human beings into a particular kind of utopian subject for sure. Oh, wouldn't someone who is not anxious? not afflicted by disease, doesn't age in the same way that we're used to people aging, wouldn't that prevent some, some of the, the causes of, of deformities and, and uh, issues that we may find ugly? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if we're a, a healthier society, would that, or do you do you imagine that this is more more about um, eugenics? That, that you put your finger right on it. <laughs> I mean, that's like I think I talked about this a little bit last time. Is like that um, the 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 relationship between eugenic thought and utopia is really complicated and thorny, and like um, you know, utopian there's a utopian element to eugenics discourse in the sense that, and, and I'm using like, I'm being, you know, very cautiously and advisedly saying that to mean very narrowly that, um, you know, early eugenics discourse, which is, you know, about like, we want our, our society to be healthier and stronger and smarter and all that stuff, um, that it, it has this utopian aim, right? But then of course, the eugenics kind of goes off the rails almost immediately and becomes about like horrible <laughs> actual programs of uh, social control right up through the final solution, right? I mean, that's like, there's a straight line from Galton to, um, to Hitler. Um, and so, yeah, so it's like to go back and like, and, and recover that initial utopian element of eugenics is like, disturbing, right? Because it also implicates utopia. And that's kind of one of the things that people often accuse utopia. Like any utopian society is going to have some kind of inbuilt um, eugenicist ideas, right? Because you have to have uh, a kind of, you know, I guess another way of putting it is like, is it a coincidence that all of these, not all, but a lot of utopias do envision like these much better looking, stronger, healthier people, right? Is that, can you separate out the fact that this seems to be like a, an outcome or like a result of a social organization in which people have better food and exercise and sunshine and, you know, they're not miserable and all that good stuff? Or, right, is it really smuggling in like an actual eugenicist program, right? And that's kind of, and like when we get into wells, that's where it really starts to be like, oh, this is actually this is starting to get to be actually eugenics now, right? Not just like, oh, it is a happy byproduct. Everyone's really healthy, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I think that, that that question, Courtney, is exactly like the crux, right? It's like, how is this? And I think it shifts over time. I think Morris is like those tiny little hints that we get, of, we can almost read them as kind of eugenicist about heredity and stuff like that. That starts to get developed more and more until you, you, know, you get up into like, like I said, like the Wellesian almost dystopian novels. Um, yeah, um, it looks like we're just, just about almost out of time. So I, let's maybe, um, start to wrap up. Um, I just wanted to say for next time, um, I want to continue on with these same questions because obviously, like I said, there's going to be a lot more to say about sexuality and love, and there's going to be like an actual event, which is exciting. <laughs> there's going to be actual plot, uh, I promise. Um, and, uh, and then of course the, um, the, the reading, and it's short, I'm just having you read like the introduction and conclusion to this uh, How for Socialism, which I think is a really interesting book. I should get a quick read. And there's really not much left of, of Needs to Work to Read either. But I will, um, Courtney, I'll, I'll email that to you and then you can distribute it to everybody 
that would be great. Uh, it's just, a, it's maybe 20 pages of a PDF. Um, so yeah, so for next time we'll do that. And like I said, I'm not promising anything, but just as a way of kind of getting people excited, I'm hoping that maybe Drew um, Pendergrass will be able to join us and talk about that book a little bit. So, um, and if not, we'll talk about it together and it'll still be good. So any last thoughts before we break up? Um, any burning insights or things that people need to get off their chats about Morris? So this is neither a burning insight nor anything that I think is especially interesting, but I was just thinking like about what you were just saying now, like about the question of eugenics and about the, you know, in some ways it's, it's like the chicken and egg, qu egg question, like what, you know, in what ways is beauty being produced is what way beauty is, be is beauty being produced by the circumstances or kind of are the circumstances um, uh, sort of well, I'm not going to be able to finish that sentence in the way that's <laughs> logical. Um, but right. it was just making me think back to that, like that, to that, that earlier paragraph about idleness and like the idea of like idleness producing ugliness. And also again, sort of like what, like what is, like what is producing these aesthetic categories? Like how are these aesthetic categories being produced? Not just how are, you know, how are they, um, you know, how are we looking at them? How are, you know, how are we imagining a future moment in which, you know, the various kinds of, you know, ills of the world, um, like the physical ills of the world that have produced, you know, things that that diminish beauty, um, that these have been, you know, these have, these have vanished. And so beauty is a much more likely possibility, but just like, what even are those categories? And like, how mm -hmm. do we, like, how do we come to them? And, you know, what do they, you know, it, what are, like what are the restrictions on them? Like it's not just that like their arm, you know, the women's arms are like very, you know, well formed for forty two year olds or you know whatever it is that the guest says at the, you know, <laughs> says at the beginning or that like they're not, you know, the women aren't dressed like um, brocade armchairs or you know like the, right. these you know, these very sort of specific things. But just that, I feel like I'm I'm having one of the things that I, that I'm enjoying thinking about and also having a really hard time getting my mind around is just like what, you know, how exactly you know, these, these words that are defining aesthetic categories need to be translated, like what, mm -hmm. you know, what, what sorts of, you know, expansive, um, I don't know, ideologies are, you know, are inherent to them. Mm -hmm. so that's something I feel like I want to think more about. And, and yes, yeah, absolutely. And that's where, yeah, we have to go back to Ruskin and I guess Kant. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have to. We won't. Don't worry. Yeah, let's <laughs> yes, totally I, not go back to Kant. <laughs> that's not. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, absolutely. Like what you know, I think it's interesting to think about at least in the context of this novel. How is um, how is Morris envisioning the creation of those kinds of aesthetic categories? And and insofar as he's not, maybe that's also interesting too, right? Insofar as it's just really, you, you can. I, I feel like you can feel that there are places where he's making arguments about art. Right, where he's like trying to persuade, or as John said, like use you know engage in that kind of Ruskinian education project, and then there's other moments where he's simply taking it for granted that, of course, we all think that this particular thing is beautiful or pleasing, right? And so it's interesting to think about maybe what the differences are between those. Um, you know, why are some things um, taken for granted and other things, uh, you know, need to be you need to be persuaded about them or whatever. So. Yeah, that'd be a good thing to start with next time. So, great. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you again to the Dickens Universe people for putting this together. And I'm looking forward to next time. So, yeah.